Good evening and welcome. My name is Beth Hagopian and I'm president of the Massachusetts Society of the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. I'd like to welcome you to Prescott House, which is our headquarters here in Boston. It is one of three historic properties that we have in Massachusetts. We have a farm in Swansea, Mass, with its original acreage, 60 plus acres, and we have a house that we co-own with the Commonwealth in Quincy, called Quincy Homestead. The mission of the Dames, which was founded here in Massachusetts in 1893, is to preserve and protect historic buildings and artifacts, to encourage patriotism, and to educate our members and the public about our colonial history. Prescott House itself was purchased by the Dames in 1944, and we be, it became a National Historic Landmark in 1964, thanks to the, because William Hickling Prescott, for whom the house is named, the historian lived here from, um, and now I've just forgotten the dates, but that's all right, 1845 to 1859, thank you. You'd think I would know, I've been a docent for years, but there you go. And the, um, he was a historian and he uh, wrote the uh, history of Spain in the Americas. So welcome, and I will turn this over to Alicia Gorham. Gorham. Thank you very much, Beth, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, this uh, um, lecture this evening. I hope you find it uh, both interesting and educational. Um, before I introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Allison, I'd like to tell you a little bit about him if I could. Robert J. Allison has taught American history at Suffolk University in Boston since 1992 when he earned his doctorate in history of American civilization at Harvard. He, chairs, he currently chairs Suffolk, history, uh, Suffolk, Suffolk University's history department and also teaches history at the Harvard Extension School. His books include The American Revolution, A Concise History, 2011, The Crescent Obscured, The United States and the Muslim World, 1776 to 1815 in 2000, A Short History of Boston, 2004, and A Short History of Cape Cod in 2010. Stephen Decatur, Northern uh, American Naval Hero, 2005, The Boston Massacre, 2006, and The Boston Tea Party in 2007. He also produced, before 1776, Life in the American Colonies for the Teaching Company's Great Courses in 2009. He edited, his edited books span American history from the colonial period to the 20th century, and he currently hosts a free online course on the U.S. Constitution at http www.udemy.com slash us hyphen constitution. <laughs> Professor Allison received the Petra Shattuck Distinguished Teaching Award <clears throat> from the Harvard Extension School in 1997, the Suffolk University Student Government Association's Distinguished Faculty Award in 2006, and the Suffolk University Outstanding Faculty Award in 2007 and 2010. Professor Allison was a consultant to the Commonwealth Museum at the State Archives in Boston, and he is on the Board of Trustees of the USS Constitution Museum in Charlestown, Massachusetts. He is president of the South Boston Historical Society, vice president of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. He and his wife Phyllis have lived in South Boston since 1992, Two of their sons, John, Robert, and Philip, attain, attended St. Bridget's School. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Allison. I was a little worried with the detail Gorham knows about me. That <laughs> Thank you very much for that wonderful, generous introduction. And thank you, Beth and the Dame, Beth Hagopian and the Dames, for hosting this wonderful gathering. And thank you to the Society of the Cincinnati and Alicia Tucker for inviting me to speak here. I realize this isn't the first time that the Cincinnati is, the Society of the Cincinnati has honored me with an invitation. And 
Usually I'm all that stands between them and an open bar, so I'm always <laughs> conscious of keeping things concise and interesting. Um, as I think uh, Gora mentioned, the members of the Cincinnati from Massachusetts or the chapter of the Cincinnati from Massachusetts being one of the largest at the inception, and that wasn't an accident because Massachusetts sent more men to the Continental Army than any other state. And this wasn't just because the war began here, it was because till the end of the war, Massachusetts continued to send men to the Continental Army, to the support of the cause, which in many ways began here. And I realized that this is being taped for showing in other parts of the country. However, I think we can say without fear of contradiction that without Massachusetts, the revolution would not have happened and it certainly would not have taken on the cast that it did. It began here for good reason, and it was because of the contribution of Massachusetts that we live under the form of government that was devised in the late 1780s. It began, uh, now always deciding when to begin is a tricky time. John Adams, who probably had as much right as anyone to an opinion on this, said that the revolution began in 1760, and it was accomplished by 1775 before, as he said, a drop of blood was shed on Lexington Green. The revolution, and after that, he said, the war for independence began. The revolution was something that happened in the minds of people as they decided how they would be governed. And we can see this happening in the years before 1776, when, as we know, independence is declared and the nation traces its origins to that auspicious day. I'm not going to begin in 1760. Uh, you'll be happy to know, perhaps. Uh, um, I guess on the drinking portion of the evening, I can talk about <laughs> that. So it's 1773, I always see as the time or the moment or the year from which there would be no turning back. And it was a tranquil year. In fact, Governor Thomas Hutchinson said that uh, in 1772 he wrote about how calm things were in Massachusetts, which had had a turbulent decade of the 1760s. And then of course there was that unhappy event on King Street on March 5th, 1770. But 1772, he said, things were relatively tranquil. We get along very well here. And he said, if it weren't for an Adams or two, we would get along even better. <laughs> now, what were the Adamses doing to trouble Governor Hutchinson? Samuel was the clerk of the Massachusetts Assembly and the leader of the Boston town meeting. And he was busy during this tranquil time of 1772 organizing committees of correspondence, official bodies of the Boston town meeting that would correspond with other towns in the province of Massachusetts. And as clerk of the Massachusetts Assembly, he organized a committee of correspondence to write to the other colonies. And in the scheme of thinking in London, of course, the American colonies really had no formal connection with one another. They would communicate through their royal governors to the uh, British crown or to the lords of trade, and then any communication they needed with other colonies would go by way of London. But Adams, through the Massachusetts Assembly, organized a network of communications with the other colonies and finding in other colonies like-minded individuals to write back. Very unusual to find someone who would not agree with Samuel Adams agreeing to be on one of these committees to write back. And this ensured, when the trouble begins in 1773 and 1774, that the story from Boston and the story from Massachusetts is the one being told in New York, Philadelphia, Charlestown, Annapolis, and so on. John Adams, and Samuel also was organizing the annual commemorations on March the 5th, the day he wanted to remember and live in infamy, the 5th of March, every year observed with an oration and with illuminations. People would illuminate their windows with uh, sayings and cutouts of the malefactors of March the 5th and remembering that day as a somber day, a day of reflection. John Adams, now a member of the Massachusetts Assembly, in 1772 raised the hackles of Governor Hutchinson with what seemed like an audacious proposal. After the massacre and after the trial of the British soldiers, who were, as you know, acquitted except for two, 
who were branded on the thumbs and sent to New Jersey, which was probably punishment enough for anyone. Um, <laughs> the British Crown began worrying about what would happen the next time Crown officials got into trouble in one of these provinces in the execution of their duty. Would they be as lucky as these soldiers who were acquitted? And they worried about the course of justice in the American colonies and decided as a way of ensuring impartiality among the jurists in Massachusetts and the other colonies that the Crown would pay the judges. Every year, the judges here would receive a 200 pound stipend from the British Crown as a way of ensuring that they wouldn't be beholden to the mobs. I'm always afraid of raising this issue, fearing that someone connected with the current government of Massachusetts will hear that the British Crown wants to pay the judges here. Maybe we can get them to, um... well, the assembly in Massachusetts then was probably as, probably more parsimonious than the assembly today and was worried about crown of it, or gov judges in Massachusetts not being answerable to the people who chose them, having an influence from beyond Massachusetts on the judicial proceedings. So the Massachusetts Assembly demanded that all the judges in Massachusetts refuse this stipend under penalty of actually having the assembly remove them from the bench entirely or raising public opprobrium in other ways. And every judge in Massachusetts agreed not to accept the crown salary, rejecting it out of hand. Every judge but one. And that was the Chief Justice of the Superior Court, Peter Oliver. And Judge Oliver was an ironmonger, that is, he had an iron business. And being a judge actually cost him a good deal of time, as well as money from his business, as judges then had to travel throughout the province hearing cases. And is anyone here a judge, by the way? So I'm told that the cases usually aren't that interesting. You go out to Worcester and you have to stay in a tavern, might sound more appealing to some of you than others, and often sleeping in the same rooms with all of the council who would travel around the province together. The cases would be heard in the tavern room and you would travel from place to place hearing these cases of farmers and mechanics, which usually weren't very interesting. And Oliver reckoned how much he spent every year on doing this and the 200 pounds a year the Crown was offering didn't even come close to meeting his expenses. So he had no problem with accepting this. If the Crown wanted to give him 200 pounds a year, well, that was more to the good. The Assembly wasn't happy with this because according to the Charter of 1691, it was the Assembly's prerogative to pay the judges. Judges could not accept a salary from someone else. Clearly, it said in the Charter that the assembly paid the judges. And here, Judge Oliver said, and incidentally, Judge Oliver was also the brother-in-law of Governor Hutchinson. <laughs> and his other brother, his brother Andrew, presided over the governor's council, was the secretary of the province. And in fact, beginning, is anyone here an Oliver or a Hutchinson? <laughs> okay. Good people. <laughs> Dedicated public servants, I should say, because in the 1760s, Thomas Hutchinson had been both the Chief Justice and the Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. And then when he was elevated to being Governor of Massachusetts, he obviously had to give up becoming, being Lieutenant Governor, and that position fell to Andrew Oliver, and the position of Chief Justice went to Peter Oliver. And beginning in the 1770s, the Oliver and the Hutchinson children began to marry, and they always seemed to marry others. You know, Hutchinson's married Olivers and no one else, for probably for good reason. And if you're, a, if you're not a Hutchinson or an Oliver, say if you're an Otis or an Adams, you may look at this and see a concentration of power in the hands of one small elite group. Is that true? Have I misrepresented the case? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but then the question becomes, what can we do if a judge does something which we say he ought not to do except the crown salary, which we say violates the charter? Well, John Adams, a member of the assembly said, we can impeach him. And the other members of the assembly listening to him say, well, that doesn't really make much sense. No assembly has ever impeached a crown official before. That's Reason number one, not to do it. Reason number two, the assembly will impeach Judge Oliver 
then the case presumably would go to the governor's council and presiding over the governor's council is of course Governor Hutchinson, his brother-in-law, and also on the governor's council is his brother Andrew, and what Governor Hutchinson will say is the assembly can't impeach crown officials and will simply toss it out. And John Adams said, really doesn't matter. We can impeach him and we have to. So the assembly did impeach Judge Oliver in 1772 and then predictably enough, it got to the governor's council and Governor Hutchinson said the assembly can't impeach crown officials and he didn't want to hear anything more about it. So it was a troubling thing for, Ju for Governor Hutchinson though that these Adamses were raising these problems with committees of correspondence and so on and the impeachment of Judge Oliver, but he had weathered these two storms in 1772 and so thought that January of 1773 would be a propitious time to raise another problem which he saw festering here. I think that in a different lifetime, Thomas Hutchinson would have been a college professor. He, wasn't, he was a very able historian. In fact, he collected documents on Massachusetts history. And his family, by the way, had been here since the 1630s. His great, great, great grandmother, I believe it was, was Anne Hutchinson, who was kicked out for being a heretic. And that may have colored Thomas Hutchinson's view of the populace of Massachusetts as not always being on the side of the angels, no matter what we may always think. At any rate, January of 1773, Hutchinson opened the assembly, which met in Cambridge because there was smallpox in Boston. Very long speech very learned speech. As I said, he would have been a good college professor, and you should know college professors are good, are good at lecturing. And we like it when you listen. We like it when you write down what we are saying. <laughs> and we know how smart you are by how closely you agree with what we have just said. And if somehow you disagree, we assume it's because you didn't quite understand, so we will repeat it more slowly using smaller words. Um, college professors typically, and I don't want to get into current situations, typically don't make very good politicians. Different skills involved in both. Hutchinson began his speech by explaining the nature of the British Empire, which was changing. And you can see this in the acts of trade the Parliament had passed in the 1760s, attempting to regulate trade in the empire, acts which Americans had resisted and protested. But Americans clearly didn't understand the course of empire and the fact that parliament was the governing force in the British Empire. And parliament was supreme in the British Empire, whatever the charter of Massachusetts said notwithstanding. And we in Massachusetts had to accept that because we are part of the empire. Parliament governs the empire. And the only choice here in Massachusetts is to submit to the will of parliament, which is the freest deliberative body in the world, or declare our independence. And then we could expect to enjoy the liberties of subjects of other empires, less beneficent, the Dutch empire, or the Spanish empire, or the French empire. We obviously could not sustain ourselves beyond the British Empire, which has allowed us to become prosperous and wealthy, and to a large extent to govern our own affairs. Very learned speech, quite well, I guess it would have been better as a lecture, and college professors, as I said, are good at lecturing, and the Massachusetts Assembly did not prove to be very willing students of Professor Hutchinson. They hadn't thought of it, well, they thought uh, they had not thought in terms such as he had put them, submission or independence. Well, they hadn't really thought about independence, but one thing they knew is they were sent by the people in Framingham or Duxbury or Dorchester or Roxbury or Boston. They were beholden to them, the people in their town meetings who had sent them. They were the people who governed in Massachusetts, not the parliament. And if our choice is submission to an outside power, or independence, we hadn't quite thought of it that way, but guess that's our choice. Although they don't yet talk about that openly. And in fact, Hutchinson thought that once people in London read his very learned address to the assembly, they would thank him for finally putting things in perspective and explaining to the assembly what its role was here, and its role was quite limited. Instead, 
People in London were quite upset with this. It's, so far, no one had mentioned independence, and now Hutchinson tells them it's their choice, and, well, they knew the assembly couldn't accept submission, and so things very quickly begin going badly for Governor Hutchinson. Even members of the assembly inclined to support him realize they can't go back to their constituents and say, look, our choice is either submitting to the will of parliament or declaring independence, so we better submit to the will of parliament. That's not going to go over well in Framingham or Duxbury or Dorchester or Roxbury or Boston or these other towns. So thing, the, the assembly then does what it had done back in 1768 and 69 when it had got into a fight with Governor Bernard. They ask their agent in London, Benjamin Franklin, to ask the Privy Council to look into recalling Governor Hutchinson and sending someone else, which is something the assembly could do. So, you have in 1773, the beginning with an auspicious moment, Governor Hutchinson lecturing to the assembly, and immediately it backfires politically. And it's actually at this moment that John Singleton Copley does that stunning portrait of Samuel Adams, commissioned actually by John Hancock. And Adams is pointing at the Massachusetts Charter of 1691. This is what gives the assembly its power and prerogative. We have a written charter. It's not up to Parliament or the governor to decide the charter now has changed or the time has passed this by. It's a written charter. And in his other hand, he is holding the instructions from the town of Boston. The people of Boston had elected Samuel Adams and had the power to instruct him as to how he should vote. This is the meaning of this portrait. We're focusing on Adams' hands, pointing to the charter, holding the instructions of his constituents. This is a signal moment in American political history as Hutchinson has explained the changing nature of power in the empire and Samuel Adams is pointing to the sources of power in Massachusetts. So Parliament, uh, or I'm sorry, the Privy Council is asked to look into whether Hutchinson should be recalled. And following this, a couple of other things happen which indicate that things will not go well for Governor Hutchinson or for um, the Olivers. First, Hutchinson, uh, by the way, Peter Oliver later, later wrote a history of the American Revolution. Has anyone read this? No, not even the, okay, Peter Oliver. And his explanation for what happened was quite simple. A couple of guys in Boston, namely Samuel Adams and James Otis, really hated Thomas Hutchinson. And they were able to whip up popular enthusiasm so much against him that he was forced out of office and ultimately Massachusetts led the way to independence. So it was because of the centralization of this political hysteria in Boston that we had this revolution. Uh, Oliver wrote this from London where he was in exile in the late 1770s. There is an element of truth in that and both Samuel Adams and James Otis did have almost a pathological hatred for Thomas Hutchinson uh, but that's not what triggers the revolution. Instead, it's something else, and something that really caught Judge Oliver by surprise. Remember, in 1772, the assembly had impeached him. He had weathered that because the governor's council threw it out. In 1773, 1774, Judge Oliver goes to Worcester to open a session of court. Court's impaneled. Judge, the judge is sitting behind his bench. The jurors are brought in. The jurors sit down. The jurors look over at the judge and say, you've been impeached by our assembly. We can't serve in a court over which you preside until this matter has been resolved. And they get up and walk out. I don't know if you've ever been on a jury and done that. I don't recommend it. But it's impossible for Judge Oliver to impanel a jury in Worcester. He thought the whole problem was in Boston because these two guys hated his brother-in-law. It turns out these farmers in Worcester County won't serve in a court because he is sitting there. He finds a similar experience in Salem and in other places. So his term as a judge ends because no juror in Massachusetts will serve under him. This is, I think, what John Adams meant by this revolution happening in the minds of people deciding how they will be governed and deciding who will govern them. And then, of course, the other thing that happens is this, um, well, it involves a set of letters Thomas Hutchinson had written to 
a British official in the 1760s explaining the political situation in Massachusetts, and these fell into the hands of Benjamin Franklin. In the midst of this big fight between the assembly and the governor, Franklin in England as the assembly's representative finds these letters that Hutchinson wrote telling, quite frankly, what he thought about the assembly and members of the assembly, and he sends them to Samuel Adams. <laughs> With a stricture of secrecy, these are private letters and can't be published under any circumstances. He tells Adams that, and Adams knows exactly what to do with letters that can't be published under any circumstances. He locks the doors to the assembly chamber and has the clerk read them to the members of the assembly who catch certain phrases. You know, these people can't expect, having ventured 3,000 miles from England, that they would enjoy all the rights of Englishmen. And maybe they have to be crushed a little bit so that you can appreciate how good it is under the British Empire. And maybe what we should do is bring a few ringleaders back to stand trial and execution dock, and that will calm things down. Other than that, the letters are pretty mild, but people do hear some of these phrases. And, and actually then, after about two weeks, as members go out and tell people what they have just heard, and this finds its way into the public press, Adams announces he's found another set of the letters that don't have the same strictures of privacy. These can be published, and it may be one of the best-selling documents ever published by the Massachusetts Assembly, the letters of Governor Thomas Hutchinson to others, which ruin Hutchinson, what was left of Hutchinson's reputation here in Massachusetts. So this destroys Hutchinson, who asks to be allowed to come back to England to plead his case. In fact, Hutchinson always referred to England as home, even though he was, of course, born in this town and educated in this town and spent most of his life in this town. And then, of course, in May, Parliament passed the Tea Act, not thinking at all about Massachusetts. It's always startling for us here to think that Parliament wasn't as consumed with us as we believe. I think we in Massachusetts always imagine the rest of the world watching what we do and looking for leadership from us. Um, Parliament wasn't thinking about Massachusetts. Parliament was thinking about East India and the wealth of the Indies and passed the Tea Act accordingly. And this, as we all know, led to this episode in December, the destruction of the tea, in which um, 900 some odd chests of tea were dumped into the harbor, valued at over one and a half million pounds. Or, and um, John Adams called this an epic, he said the people should never rise without doing something memorable. And this, he thought, was sublime. <laughs> Parliament didn't think so. And Parliament responded to the destruction of the tea by shutting down Boston Harbor, suspending the government of that charter of 1691, and, people in and no more of these town meetings. People didn't like Thomas Hutchinson as governor. The new governor would be General Thomas Gage, the commander of British military forces in North America. Also, for good measure, Franklin was stripped of his position as um, postmaster general. And the hearing he had arranged before the Privy Council looking into Thomas Hutchinson's malfeasance turned into an excoriation of Franklin, who was blamed as the mastermind behind all of this trouble, something that would have been news to Franklin, who wanted to preserve what he called that fragile China vase, the British Empire. So this is the end of 1773 begins with Governor Hutchinson thinking he can explain to the dullards in the assembly what their role is. And once he, like any good college professor, had done that, they would simply acknowledge it. It ends with Massachusetts in chaos and the government suspended. And Hutchinson finally, at the end of May of 1774, gets on a ship and goes to England, one of the last ship to leave before the port is closed. And the harbor is now filled with warships as more British soldiers are brought to keep peace in Boston. And General Gage arrived. And very quickly, we see emerging in Massachusetts two different governments. The government of General Gage, Governor Gage. And in fact, he had his secretary, uh, Thomas Flucker, is it Flucker or Fluker? Fluker, Fluker. Thomas Fluker, um, going into the, trying to get into the assembly chamber to read the proclamation that Governor Gage has suspended the assembly. But they figured out how to lock the door, as I think I explained. He's locked out. He nails this to the door. Inside, the members of the assembly are choosing delegates to a Continental Congress to meet in 
Philadelphia, hoping to bring the other colonies into an alliance with Boston, with Massachusetts. And you have then the assembly is suspended. The members of the assembly trek out to Watertown and meet as a provincial congress. Gage, meanwhile, wants to assemble his government. Again, it was a long-standing wish of these governors to move the assembly out of Boston, where it was thought it would be subject to the whims of the Boston mob. And Gage wants to move it to Salem or somewhere else. He has trouble in paneling a new government, which will not have an elected assembly. So this is the state of things in 1774, as we have two different governments emerging in Massachusetts. One has a charter and commission from the British Crown, as the earlier one had. The other has the sanction of the people in the towns of Massachusetts. And in September of 1774, the Congress met in Philadelphia, and John Adams described it as the happiest day of his life. Paul Revere arrived with the Suffolk Resolves, Resolves of Suffolk County, calling on the other colonies to join with Massachusetts and resisting these changes in the administration of the empire brought about by the ministry and to resist. And instead of telling Massachusetts, you've really gone too far this time, we don't want to have the same thing happen to us, that is the closing down of our ports and the suspension of our governments that happened to you, as instead the Congress sides with Massachusetts. This, Adam said, was the happiest day of his life, and he left Philadelphia with high hopes that now the Congress had sent a petition to the British Crown, calling on the Crown to uh, have the ministry ease up on its uh, crackdown on Boston and on Massachusetts. The other colonies were going to stand with Boston, and Adams left Philadelphia expecting never to return to that big city, the largest city he had ever set foot in. The message goes off, and Congress does say we'll meet again in the spring. And when Congress did meet again in May of 1775, it was after the colonies had seemed to receive the British Crown's reaction to their olive branch petition. And that was the bloodshed at Lexington and Concord. General Gage was empowered to disarm the colonists, which he did quite uh, effectively, uh, or almost quite effectively, Powder House in uh, Somerville, what's now Somerville, Powder in uh, Salem, trying to get the arms at Portsmouth. Unfortunately for Gage, there was a warning afoot. And then going out to Lexington and Concord to gather the munitions there. And this seemed to be the response of the British Crown, the beginning of a war, uh, what we'll call the War for Independence, which um, Alicia reminded us, is the most significant event in modern history, the revolution and this war for independence which ensued. So the next meeting of Congress happened after war had begun. You know, George Washington, chosen a delegate from Virginia to this Congress, left Virginia in May expecting to be home by the end of June because he had a lot of things to attend to back on his farm. And Washington was a very busy man and a very good businessman and farmer, but he would work in service to uh, this cause. So he did go to Philadelphia expecting that he would be back by July. He'll be back in 1783, actually. <laughs> and he arrived in Philadelphia. Actually, John Adams wrote in his diary one day during this session of Congress, Colonel Washington appears in his uniform. And from that one line, you'll see historians making all kinds of grand claims that Washington wore his uniform every day, that he didn't appear in anything else. And then we have to interpret what exactly he meant by this. I think it's quite astonishing that he fit into this uniform after all of these years of being a civilian farmer. Washington immediately was put on the committees Congress created to look into defenses of New York and how to organize an army. and was seemed to be the one member of Congress who understood how a military should operate or should, uh, should be organized. And Congress, in the wake of Lexington and Concord, you know, the British march out to seize these weapons and the militia is roused in Lexington and Concord and other towns and by the end of the day, the British are back in Boston and Charlestown and now there are 20,000 militia troops surrounding them in Cambridge and Roxbury, preventing 
General Gage and his men from getting provisions, from getting firewood or livestock or grain or anything else they would need to survive in the town of Boston. This is something they hadn't expected. And also no one had, in Congress had expected what to do or knew what to do with 20,000 militia troops surrounding Boston. So Congress debated, actually John Adams proposed having Congress adopt them as a continental army. And as Adam, the Congress was beginning to think along this line that maybe they should be a continental army. And they said, okay, we'll begin the debate today and after we've agreed on how to organize it, we'll figure out how exactly it should be um, administered, who should run it. And Adam says, maybe we should start thinking about the officer who should be in charge. And he said, I have in mind someone. Someone who is known throughout the colonies. Someone who already has a military reputation. Someone who has a private fortune. He is already committed to the cause. And Adams realized as he was speaking, out of one eye he could see presiding over the Congress, John Hancock commander of the Corps of Cadets, that is one of the leading military officials in Massachusetts, a man who was known throughout the colonies, one of the wealthiest men in the provinces. I mean, he did have a private fortune and he had committed it to this cause and Hancock imagined that Adams was talking about him. And he began sitting up. Is anyone a Hancock here, by the way? <laughs> sitting up uh, in his chair. And then Adams saw out of his other eye Washington sitting by the door. And Washington also got the sense Adams was talking about him. He didn't respond the way Hancock did. He got up and went through the door and left the room. <laughs> and then Adams said, the person I have in mind is Colonel George Washington of Virginia. And Hancock glowered at him and never really forgave him for this as Adams later said. And Washington realized he was nominated and said, you may count on it. From this day, I count the end of my reputation. He realized that this would not be an easy thing. Now, Washington sets off, and actually, Washington also agreed he would serve, but only without a salary. Now, Congress appointed other generals, most notably Charles Lee, and they were happy to get Charles Lee because he was a real general. He was a British general. He had served in Europe, and Lee was a retired British general living in the American colonies. Washington insisted he serve without a salary. Lee was actually giving up his pension from the British Army in order to serve this cause, so he wanted to be compensated. So it actually took about two weeks to negotiate Charles Lee's contract to serve as the second in command. Are there any Lee descendants here? Well, interesting, I mean, interesting individual. Washington sets out for Boston and on the way, he's in New York, when a dispatch comes from Boston for Congress and realizes he's on official business, he should see what it says, and it's news of the Battle of <coughs> Bunker Hill. In June, uh, three new British generals had arrived in Boston, Burgoyne and Clinton and Howe, and they had left England thinking, boy, you know, the gauge is holding on in Massachusetts, there are some recalcitrant rebels they reach Boston and find out that Gage is surrounded by 20,000 militia troops and doesn't have the possibility of getting fresh provisions, water, firewood. Now, these may not seem like significant things to us, but imagine there is no way to cook or heat the house, particularly on a day like today. And the British in Boston were doing what would have come naturally, which is knocking down fences, cutting down trees, taking off shingles, knocking down some old buildings, including the old Church of the Mathers in the North End. And mm -hmm. we take this as being mean-spirited. It's simple common sense that you need firewood. You're not going to care whose old church this is or whose benches these are or fences or so on. So the British had decided to, as General Burgoyne said, get a little elbow room, march out of Boston through Charlestown over to Cambridge, disperse the rebel camps there in Cambridge, and then go south to Roxbury, disperse the rebels there, get a wider area, and send these folks back into the countryside, and hopefully they would all go home and forget about the rebellion. That was the idea. And in fact, on the um, 15th of June, Henry Clinton, General Henry Clinton, had gone to scout out the ground on Breeds Hill and Bunker Hill, the highest points north of Boston, and there were pasture land. 
you know, rising behind the town of Charlestown. There was nothing there. So early the next, the next day, the British begin their assaults. It's now mid-afternoon on a hot June day, and these British troops march up Bunker Hill, or Breed's Hill. And the idea isn't to get Breed's Hill. The idea is to keep marching till you get to Cambridge. But at the top of Breed's Hill, this battery that had not been there the day before opens fire on them, something they had not expected. These rebels overnight had put up a fortification that these British troops can't take. They retreat, the survivors retreat to the bottom of the hill. General Howe orders another assault. General Clinton notices that there are sharpshooters aiming at these British ranks from the town of Charlestown. So he has the ships in the harbor lob some burning devices into the town to burn it down. The British begin another assault to the top of the hill again. They encounter this fire from the battery on the top of Breed's Hill. They turn back again, they get to the bottom, and now House says, we're going to drop our packs. They've been carrying three days' worth of provisions, tents and other things. They're going to drop their packs, take this hill, which they do. By this time, the rebels are almost out of ammunition. And so they do then what was extraordinary for men who were not trained soldiers. Some men stay in the battery to hold off the British assault until the rest of the army can get back to Cambridge. They realize they can't hold the hill forever. At the end of the day, the British hold Breed's Hill. And 900 British casualties out of an army of about 3,000. More of the officers the British lose in the Revolutionary War, one out of every eight died on that day in June of 1775. And um, Nathaniel Green, an officer from Rhode Island, said he wished he could sell them another hill at the same price. <laughs> General Howe said that small armies like ours can't afford such large casualties. This was a disaster. And even worse, Howe and the other British officers believed if the Americans have a chance to fortify a position, we can't attack it. For the rest of the war, the British would never try to attack a position the Americans had had time to fortify. Howe later said that these men could do overnight what would take his men three months to accomplish. And he talked about his soldiers worrying now about these Americans who were able to fly through the air like Aladdin's genie and place a fortification at the top of a hill. They didn't know that the Americans were almost out of ammunition. Um, but they no longer thought that this was just a rabble of undisciplined farmers who would scatter at the first sight of a really well-trained army. Now Washington read the dispatches from Bunker Hill and he thought what he had heard was true. The New Englanders were, as John Adams told him, fierce as lions, ready to brave any danger. This was the making of a great army. And all Washington wanted to do was come to Boston or come to Cambridge and get these men ready for another attack like this. Let the British have another victory like Bunker Hill. The British public would withdraw its support from this war effort and force them to give up the war. That was Washington's hope, to have another battle like that. Draw the British out of Boston. He arrived here on the 5th of July of 1775 and discovers the army isn't what John Adams had said it was. Fierce as lions, ready to brave any danger. These New Englanders, he never quite reconciled himself to them. First, they were really dirty. They didn't bathe very often. And they didn't have any order. Worse, they didn't know how to dig latrines. You have 20,000 men living in these camps between Cambridge and Roxbury, relieving themselves wherever they felt like it which is actually a disaster, going to be a disaster for an army, if you think about it. I see you're shocked at this very idea. They're, they don't listen to orders either. Washington can never find out exactly how many men he has under his command. The first thing he does is send out an order, tell me how many men you have. And, well, you would think these guys work for the Registry of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> well, no, we don't actually have that report yet. We're not quite sure. And, and now Washington as the, is supposed to be paying all of these guys because this is now the Continental Army. And there is another big problem here. All militia troops are paid by the month. And 
Before they became the Continental Army, it was the responsibility of Massachusetts to pay the Massachusetts troops, Connecticut to pay the Connecticut troops, Rhode Island to pay the Rhode Island troops, New Hampshire to pay the New Hampshire troops, but now it's the responsibility of Washington and the Congress to pay all of them as the Continental Army. Well, you know what? Massachusetts troops are paid by the lunar month, not the calendar month. So if there happen to be two full moons this month, we get paid twice. We get paid when the moon is full. Now, if it happens to be a full moon and we get paid and the guys from Connecticut don't, they go complain to Washington about why, how come those guys are getting paid and we are not? This is uh, a difficult thing. Also, in Connecticut, the regiments had 1,100 men. Massachusetts, they had 900, 1,000, so if you want to transfer men, very difficult to do. These are difficulties Washington finds here. He does find some officers he likes and some reason for hope here. Actually, one thing he finds that's really troubling, they miscounted the amount of gunpowder on hand. When he arrived, they said, we have 300 barrels. A week later, they say, you know what? We forgot to deduct how much we used Bunker Hill. Um, each man has enough for about nine rounds. And it's at that moment that Washington had everyone leave the room, and then you would be surprised at the language Washington actually knew and could use when he was provoked. <laughs> Two officers impress Washington. On his way to inspect the fortifications in Roxbury, he met Henry Knox a bookseller from Boston, not actually in the army at the time, but he had built fortifications at Fort Hill and Roxbury. Impressive fortifications. This is someone who knows how to build fortifications, who knows military science. And Washington made Knox the, he had co Congress commission Knox a colonel in charge of artillery. It's kind of a good news, bad news thing. Good news is you're the colonel in charge of artillery. The bad news is the artillery is at Fort Ticonderoga and you have to go get it. <laughs> And the other was Nathaniel Green of Rhode Island. And Green, with his Rhode Island troops, was in Roxbury. And what impressed Washington about Green was his men had dug latrines. <laughs> he has Green and the Rhode Island group brought over to uh, Prospect Hill. And actually, by 17, in 1783, there will only be three officers still in the army who were in service in 1775. Washington, Knox, and Green. And Knox does go off to Fort Ticonderoga and brings back the artillery by oxen. Oxen drag this artillery, 90 pieces of artillery across Massachusetts. And in early March, it's put on the top of Dorchester Heights in what is now South Boston. And what Washington expects to happen now is the British will come out and attack, and when they do that, we will move into Boston and attack them. That was the plan, and the British do, in fact, come out to attack, but a big storm blows up, and they're unable to take the heights, and General Howe realizes his only recourse is to leave. Howe and the other British officers understood that Boston was untenable as a place from which to win back the loyalty of Americans, but also understood having brought this big army over, if they failed to hold Boston, that would be a disaster for British, in British public opinion. But Washington and the artillery give not how no choice but to leave. And on the 17th of March, 1776, the British army withdraws from Boston. This is the first American victory in the war for independence. In fact, and independence would be declared three months later. It was uncertain whether it could be won. But having forced the British out of Boston, Washington and this group of militia troops, which he begins forging into a continental army, make it inevitable that the Americans would be able to win independence and sustain it. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Did you want questions? Yeah, you can take questions. Just, oh, yeah, what time is it? It is uh, 7.20. All right. So How about we ask questions over libations? Over libations, I will be happy to answer questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.